at me. Uh, tonight, right, I'm uh, pondering love, romantic love mostly, because they say, you know, since the death of God, since Nietzsche done him in, right, people look for salvation through romantic love. In it, right, that at the beginning of a relationship, you pretend to be much nicer than you actually are. <laughs> like, for the first bit of a relationship, oh, hello, yeah, no, I just nod and listen, yeah, I nod and listen, yeah, I'm much nicer than I actually am, yeah, come back to mine, come back to mine, it'll be lovely, yeah, this what's a wonderful life, oh, the end, yeah, I find the end bit very touching, oh, you've got a bit of hair on your face, just there, just a little bit of hair on your face there, oh, no, you put the phone down first, no, you put the phone down first, you put the phone down first, then, like, so, after about a week, I have to go, um, oh, Oh, by the way, I probably should have mentioned this. It's like black eels flood out of my abdomen. There's spores and smoke and evil. Then I have to be like a flasher doing up his Mac. So, oh, sorry about that. I do apologise for those eels. Should we put Wonderful Life back on? No, no, thank you. I don't want to watch it since the eels. Right, it makes me like lament the death of chivalry and romance, because when you hear older people talking about how they met, it's always such beautiful, romantic stories, so much more beautiful and romantic than the tales we have of how we meet people now. You know, well, um, sit down, sit down. So I was on MySpace, and, and I saw your granny, and I noticed she had quite big boobs. So, <laughs> you know, I used my fame to disorientate Gran and confuse her. She came on a date, and, you know, then your mum was born. I, I wasn't around then, of course, I moved on. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to this, like, elderly lady reciting the romantic tale of how she met her husband. It's very moving. We were coming out, and as we walked along, I dropped my glove. And this chap came up and he said to me, You forgot your glove. Well, there was a song out at the time called You Forgot Your Glove. And he gave me the glove mm. and... We walked out, the four of us, but he wasn't walking with me. He was walking with my friend. Oh, so perfect and romantic. She actually dropped a glove. That's like archetypical, isn't it? Cinderella and a glass slipper. Beautiful. It like resonates in your imagination. Uh, Madam, you forgot this. That's so beautiful. But I bet that song, Dropped Your Glove, was shit, though. That's a, <laughs> there was a song at the time, Drop Me Glove. I dropped me glove. Pick the proper big stick. I dropped me glove. Bloody old Nazi. I dropped me glass, I do, I do, I do, do in the lamp of walk. <laughs> but also, that story will be a bit less romantic if drop my glove is not literal, a literal glove literally being dropped, but in fact, a euphemism for farting. Now, <laughs> bear that in mind when you watch it again. And as we walked along, I dropped my glove. <laughs> oh, you dirty old cow. <laughs> I know it is puerile to talk about flatulence, but uh, we are gonna now. <laughs> Sometimes, if you're alone with a woman, and like someone's definitely done a raspberry, and you sort of go, and they're like, you know it's not you, because you are you, ain't you? And you go to them, did you do that? And she goes, no, no, I didn't. <laughs> well, did the house do it then? <laughs> Look at this scientist, right, trying to work out how to attract women. A scientist, might I mention, who's wearing a sort of hair hat, like Davy Crockett's hat, right? And he's clearly, when talking about how to attract women, he don't want to sound gay. And, like, in not sounding gay, he ends up sounding like a right raving Nancy boy queen. You see, he's trying to fight it, but it just comes out proper gay in his hair hat. If women really are pressed as to what physical characteristics of males they find to be a turn-on, then surprisingly they don't cite large muscles or large genitalia, but they talk about small bottoms. They like a small, tight backside, perhaps with uh, jeans stretched tightly across it. Why the jeans bit at the end? Didn't have to 
say that? That was fantasy, wasn't it? That, that, that wouldn't have come up in a survey. Oh, excuse me, madam, can I, can I have a bit of your time? Yeah, there's my badge, that's my identification. I uh, just wanted to ask you about sexual attraction. Um, what is it that you look for in a man? A great big cock, please! <laughs> a big, slick, fucking dirty cock! <laughs> nervous about it. You know, yeah, one of the reasons I can't get into a serious relationship is because I sort of worry about how boring it would be to be in a monogamous relationship. Monogamy is only one letter different from monotony. Don't try and check that in your mind. It's just one letter different. And like when you see something like this, it really enforces this idea. Right? I mean, I'm sure they're dead lovely, this couple, but they seem a little bit dull. Listen to them explaining how they've met each other in what I can only describe as tedious detail. I was uh, with my young brother Duncan mm. and uh, we were stood here listening to the band and watching them over there. Mm. And uh, I turned round <laughs> and uh, saw Christine which was stood up there. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't you just go, I met her in that club, right? <laughs> if they'd gone, I met her in that club, would anyone go, well, could you explain exactly where you were <laughs> in the club? But what did he wear, that bloke, when he goes out on the razzle-dazzle to do a bit of womanising? Put on your glad rags! Come on! Hey, look out, I'm coming through! It's party time! Right, look at what he's wearing. And, uh, I was wearing a grey leather jacket with a grey a grey tie and grey trousers. <laughs> Who's that guy? <laughs> Who's the guy in the grey? <laughs> Dionysus, let's die tonight! <laughs> I was wearing grey trousers, grey tie, grey shoes, grey hopes and dreams, grey ambitions. I was wearing white socks, but I'd put them in a the wash with some black pants and they'd come out grey. <laughs> Bless him, he has an attempt at being romantic writing this love letter, but even when he tries to be Byronic, there's something in him that drags him back to being boring. He can't help it. He's listening to him. He's got the best intentions. I'll try and write a romantic letter. Here we go, then. Let's get the old romance out, but the boringness drags him back in. Dear Chris, hello, my little stick of honeysuckle. How are you, my love? I hope that you are having the great weather out there in El Spain. Just you wait until you come back. I'm going to give you a 14-hour cuddle and a good squeeze. I got my car back on Tuesday night and put a new air filter in, but it doesn't seem to be much better. I'm going to give you such a cuddle. Well, I got the car back from the Mendes. Does need a new carburetor, but the pressure in the tyres is all right. Phew! <laughs> Right, if that bloke is the antithesis of romance, the anti-romantic, this woman, all right, she has, you know when you um, meet people who are a bit too romantic, they romanticise everything. I'm going to have a bird like this once, probably done my nothing. She's really romantic <laughs> about everything. Like, everything is too descriptive and laden with symbology and importance. And like, while she rabbiting on, you can just see her husband thinking, why did I marry this woman? Why did I marry this fucking woman? Let me get away from you can see it, it's written right on his face, have a look. Late in the afternoon, the sun was setting, the train a trifle late came in from the west, and through two pairs of glass windows, as the train moved, slowly to a standstill, I saw a man sitting in a carriage, and he turned out to be John. <laughs> Why did I get on that fucking train? <laughs> right, she just turns everything mundane into the poetic, which in a way is a kind of alchemy and we should appreciate it. But listen to this, when she talks about a trip to the lavvy. She talks about a trip to the lavvy. Look, she does it up as. When he left the carriage, I felt a sense of overwhelming misery and I couldn't account for it. I went to have a pee in the lavatory. And it was the most mournful pee I've ever had in my life. Who keeps a league of mournful weeds? <laughs> now that one was quite mournful, I thought. <laughs> then was the one after we lost the cricket to the Windies. <laughs> Don't worry about what weeds were mournful. Get we all right. <laughs> There are other ways of finding love and romance. I've tried lonely arts columns in the past. If you are going to use a lonely arts column, right, 
why not try approaching it with an air of positivity and in a context in which you can respect yourself? Hello, no name lady. Um, my name's Harry. I live in Dawlish. <laughs> I'm 60, um, which puts me at the top end of your uh, age group. I'm six foot two. Yeah, six foot two is probably too tall to be in a sink. <laughs> Like a rubbish scar face. See <laughs> that pelican fly? Like, if I listen, though, when he's trying to describe himself to a prospective sexual partner, right, he really, really down on himself and hard on himself. Listen to his grim inventory of glum sadness and terror. Listen to him. I'd like to be slimmer. I, my hair is greying a lot, and, but he's all my own, as are my teeth. Um, Mental capacity, yeah, I think the jury's still out on that one. Well, I've just come. Um, I'm a retired police officer. Could do with losing about a stone, I suppose, if I'm honest. If I'm not what, what you're looking for, then all the best to you. I hope you find whatever it is. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, I've got terrible B.O. <laughs> I drink too much, uh, I don't like children, I don't trust them, their eyes are too close together. When I become intimate with someone, I use violence to control them. <laughs> give us a call, bye, love you. We're going to have a quick commercial break, see you in a minute. Ponder. I'm pondering love and sex tonight, ain't I? Uh, I've been thinking about this sort of relationship between sex and love, right? Because it's one of them things, isn't it? If you're in a long-lasting sort of relationship, you have to find ways to spice up sex, like uh, chocolate. I'm against using chocolate in sex, because I think it ruins both things a bit, you know? <laughs> I like chocolate, I like sex, never the twain shall meet. <laughs> Because I once had a sexual encounter, good it was, really enjoyed it, and uh, I used mini eggs in that sexual situation, right? Now, the mini egg is better than the Malteser, because the Malteser, it can't cut it when it gets to the rough stuff, right? Whereas the, the mini egg has got a hardened shell, which gives it an extra 20 seconds of what I call bum life. But... <laughs> The difficulty is, with the uh, mini egg, is that, like, on its journey in, it goes in sort of all colourful, all pink or yellow and blue, all, da, 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 all jolly and upbeat, and then when it comes out, it's all pale and jaded like a Vietnam vet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you all right? No, I'm not all right. Come on, it wasn't that bad. You weren't there, man! You weren't there! So, right, what I don't like about the mini egg is it's advertised by that parrot idiot who I don't like at all. He's too cocky and confident about everything. And the problem with mini eggs is, like, during sex, it ain't a sexy word. The audio aspect of it ain't a good one, right? Because if you're having even really good sex, oh, yeah, oh, I'm really enjoying this sex. Oh, I'm using all my best moves. Oh, yeah, oh, I like being inside you. Oh, yeah, we are as one. We are together. We are unified spiritually, physically. Oh, Oh, we are one thing. Oh, I'm just going to get them mini eggs. <laughs> Gotta say the words, mini eggs. Get the mini eggs. Fix the mini eggs, won't you? Shut up. <laughs> then that parrot turns up in your brain. Hello! Hello! <laughs> it's Mr. Cadbury's parrot. Hello! <laughs> I fucking hell, I need you, don't I? <laughs> course, has a, such a liberal attitude to the old anky-panky, as your father was in a monkey business. Some people, right, are a bit scared of sex. Some people, even the word sex, even the language about sex. This woman here, she's so lovely, right? She's so repressed, bless her heart. She's all, like, nervous. Watch her, her eyes all dark round, all sort of nervous, and you'll see she'd rather be anywhere than talking about, um, S-E-X. <laughs> I have pointed out uh, certain things when you're in love and temptations and one thing. And what sort of things can I ask you? Well, 
wanting to perhaps, um, you know, take part in sexual activities. She's lovely, that lady. Hey, what I don't like neither is the sort of sleazy world of suburban swinging, you know, where it's all a bit euphemistic and a little bit cheeky. Look at this bloke, right? Paul, he calls himself. This is hard to believe that this is actually real, this. Check this out. Paul and, you know, and I'll have to use the term, his little willy. I usually wear that. <laughs> it's, it's a little willy. It's like a condom, you slip it on. Get an erection and slip that on. And then you just talk to Willie and then women look at you talking at Willie and... Oh, who's that? Well, that's Willie. <laughs> what kind of woman is going to be inveigled by that technique? What woman, at do, sees a man, a tabby gentleman, with an erection, with a pink puppet slipped over it, sees that and thinks, Oh, hello, I mind a chat with this guy. <laughs> Let's get to know him. How can you see it with an ard on and then put that thing over it and maintain an erection? It's difficult enough sometimes, isn't it? If there's something on your mind, if you're thinking about shopping or football or something. If I look down at my willy and it's going, oh. <laughs> that to me. Difficult. He then uses, in the art of seduction, the kind of analogies that... Listen to these analogies and imagine, could you ever be seduced by this? Imagine this situation happened to you, because it's happening to someone. He starts a conversation and Willie's a bad boy and he wants to be a miner. Likes potholing down little dark tunnels and... <laughs> Are there many women, you think? That would be sexually engaged by a man who's using an analogy in which their vagina is described as a pothole. <laughs> I wouldn't mind getting inside your pothole, you know, have a little snoop round that muddy little bog. <laughs> it's not like eyes wide shut, the world of sexual seduction eyes wide shut. All oh, people wearing Venetian masks, beautiful Nubian people, all sort of twisted torsos like a Henry Moore statue, him wandering in with his willy puppet. Oh, hello, I'm here with Willy. He wouldn't mind having a little wander around Poo Poo Town. <laughs> of course, right, I suppose at best sex becomes the metaphysical embodiment of the idea of love to make physical that which had before only been abstract. Sex in the right hands can be spiritual and romantic, right? And I sort of began to realise that when I saw this about uh, Barry and Rona. Right, Barry and Rona, they're a married couple and they're sort of tantric lovers and the world they live in is both exotic, erotic, and it's beautiful it's exciting. Have a look at the way they live. Shiva, in your look, reflect her beauty back to her. Show her in your eyes how beautiful she is. Right? Look how happy and contented they are because they found a spiritual connectedness that goes beyond the animal nature of love. And they found a way of making that which is most animal somehow seem divine in their romantic liaisons with the respect and romance with which they regard each other. Look at Rona. Tits! <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I just find that very moving, I do. That's touching. But this, right, sometimes you see something so beautiful, something like this, that gives me faith in finding true love, powerful love, an eternal love. This couple, right, they were separated by a continent, hadn't seen each other for 50 years. He'd gone off to Australia, but he'd loved this woman so much, and she'd loved him so powerfully that they stayed in touch over 50 years. And it makes you think that love can cast everything else asunder. If you have love, you need nothing else. Look at this. When I met him at the airport, it was just like when I met him all those years ago. I still felt the same. My heart missed a beat, and my legs turned to jelly. I often thought about it over the years, you know. And, uh, I didn't uh, really expect to uh, ever really see her again. So, so lovely, isn't it, that the two of them 
found each other that's so beautiful and poetic and sort of gives you hope in love and that love can be found. It's never too late to fall in love. Let's have a look at how they're getting on the next day. Um, perhaps I was hoping for more than I should have. I fucking hate each other. <laughs> One day, that's all it took. And look at this bit. This is him getting back into the taxi, but this time with some sort of tragic poetry. It's snowing that day, so it's like a soft blanket of sadness is draped across the day. Have a look. But here he is, still in the old man uniform. Makes his way back to the taxi. Oh well, perhaps I've been a bit of a daft old sod, thinking I could find love at my time of life. Well, I'll just go back, I guess, and be lonely once more. Take me to the airport driver, but then he thinks, maybe, hold on, maybe I should give it another chance. Maybe I should... No, let's make sure the door's fucking shut! Because I want to get in the cab! Take me to the airport! So there's that little moment where you think, oh, he's going to dodge around again. Shut that fucking door! So I suppose that, you know, however idealistic we are, however romantic we may be, we have to accept that ultimately love is to some degree restrained and constrained by logic. That is why in issues this complicated, we must turn to the ancient scriptures, texts like the Quran and the Bible to find truth. Like this brilliant scholar who now explains to us how we should treat people who betray the sacred, holy notion of love through adultery. When you're married, you're not supposed to commit adultery. What you should know? happen if someone isn't loyal? What should happen? Crucify them. In the desert, <laughs> put one on the cross and the other one facing each other on the crosses. And, and then I'll strip them in the nude. It's for, I've said crucify him, that's not hit hard enough. Right. <laughs> crucify him in the desert. Oh no, it's getting worse. Crucify him in the desert, face to face, and then go and strip him in the nude. Does that mean the person crucified him also has to be naked? Strip him while you're nude. Right. Wait, the minute I've got these clothes off, you're in a lot of trouble. Harbour evil, we are evil. Him because I think that man is an extremely gifted theologian, probably an expert on all religious texts, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. He is a holy man and will probably be able to quote passage and verse on every psalm and parable you'd care to mention. So let's not ever be dismissive of his views. Let's hear him out. It's in the Bible. Where does it say in the Bible? In the one of the pages of the Bible, that's where it's <laughs> <laughs> One of the pages, good bit near the back, I think it's to do with Goliath or something like that. You know, Goliath versus Jesus, that fight they had in the car park. <laughs> they read the fucking Bible. You don't crucify people. Read the fucking manual. <laughs> Ultimately, what have we learned? That love is a spark of divinity, that there is salvation in love because it is the thing that unites us all. Love is the spark of divinity that is, in essence, life, that is found everywhere. And it don't matter that it's transient. It don't matter that it often breaks our heart. All that matters is we can all share it in a moment. I've pondered it, and that is my conclusion. Thank you very much. Good night, Lou. <laughs>